Okay, gotta bring you back in. I love this church. You know, it's it's even the introverts reach out and say hi to people um, during this time. I hope that you felt welcome coming in today. I hope you feel like I do every Sunday, which is a family reunion, coming back every Sunday. Here at Living Water, we exist to make disciples who make disciples. And there's a lot of that going on. Can you raise your hand if you just got done with EHS? Woo-hoo! Look at that. Hey, we just finished uh, another round of EHS, and it's a great way to make disciples who make disciples. Right, Lacey? So, um, that's what we get to do. Okay, so a couple of things coming up. In the seat back pocket is a Connect card. So just so you know that we, and, and I saw you, for those, somebody put a praise in there, and I saw that come through. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for adding praises to that. It means so much to us when we pray over the top of you. Can I be just, a, I'll be a little vulnerable with you, because I wasn't feeling very good when I came in today. I was just getting over a cold, and I knew where to go. I walked up to Pastor Georgie and Janelle, and I said, hey, can you guys pray for me? And immediately, my sinuses got a relief immediately like my eyes were like bugging out of my head when I first came in this morning can I just tell you that we serve a God that wants to heal you where you're at but he also has asked for a little bit of accountability and that is put it out there so that we can pray over you because where two or more gathered in his name there he is pretty cool huh pretty cool so make sure that you you fill out them connect cards for us will you Well, big community win, and um, as a dad and an uncle and loving on these kids, um, we had, whew, we had 41 students and 15 adults at Friendsgiving up there. Um, I got to, you know what, I'm going to claim this because what we got to see was someone's vision come true that night. That night, we proclaim that Jesus has our kids. He has our kids. And that dream, I walked up to Nevaeh and I said, this is it. This is what we talked about. Nevaeh came on January, the first Sunday in January, I don't know, a couple years ago. No youth group, just coming out of COVID. And her response was, good, let's go. How about you guys? What a great time. And my daughter brought the word. So I was pretty proud. I sat in the back. I, it was really dusty back where Pastor Bob and I were because we kept wiping our eyes. And we're like, this dust is horrible. It's horrible. But just to see those kids that had so much fun. And, you know, I just sat back and I wish I could have piped the energy that was there and the worship. They had kids up here jumping and having a great time. That's amazing time of worship. So, all right, that was cool. Um, guess what we're going to do today? We've announced it about a bazillion times. Today, Christmas comes to living water. Now we're going to have a couple of teams after, and we're going to feed you as well. So um, the doors are already locked. You can't leave. So until until you build a Christmas tree, Ian Rabadou is sitting at the back. He's a big guy. He blocks the whole entrance, and you have to decorate a tree before you can leave. He is going to let the pizza guy in, but that's about it. So, so um, we got lunch for you. Hey, let's have a good time. And, and we'll put Christmas music on. So that, if, I, if you know me, you'll know that I don't really like Christmas music. I, I don't know why, but I love worship, and it's a great means of worship. And I'm not a bah humburger. I love Christmas. It, Christmas is a ton of fun. So decorating today. Hey, we got something coming up tonight, too. It's a worship night at Worthy Coffee. If you haven't visited Worthy Coffee, this is a great opportunity for you to do that. It goes from 6 to 9 or 8 p.m. So if you don't know where Worthy Coffee is, as you're leaving, you're going to Roy, okay? You'll see Subway. How many of you know where the Subway is? It's in that same strip. It's right there where Subway is. And there's going to be signs up that says Worthy Coffee. I love the one that you're going the other direction that says Worthy Coffee behind you. And I was like, I'm already past you. Okay, fine, I'm turning around. 
So it, it's going to be a great time of worship, and you'll see some familiar faces there. So I've been to one of these, and it was so cool. Um, Joe and Frankie did that one. It was so much fun. I got to watch that kid grow up with my kid, and just to see that happen is, is amazing. Now, we've got some things coming up. Christmas in the Park is coming December, too. How many of you love Yelm? Did, did you go Yelm? I, I was at the Yelm football game the other night to watch Marlena. And I wasn't really watching the football game. I was watching my kid Marlena back there. She was cheering. And that, what a great time. I took a selfie backwards of that. Hey, Joey, Beth, if you're watching this, we gave Texas a run for their money. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. I love this community, and part of that is being part of the Christmas in the Lights or Christmas in the Park on December 2nd. We're going to have a booth out. We're going to have the ability for you to man that booth because how many of you know Yelm needs to see the light? They need to see Jesus in that. So if you're willing to do that, we're going to have more information on the events page. So if you go to Yelm, or excuse me, livingwater.com slash Yelm events, and there's a QR code right there. I like QR codes. It makes it way easy. You just snap that QR code. It'll take you to those events that are going on around. So you'll get to find this event there. So sound fun? It's going to be a great time. I'm going to be in Las Vegas. Sorry. But it's going to be a great time. It's National Rodeo Finals. Got to be there. So I'm going there to watch them rodeo. So, all right. So now is a great time. We get to give our tithes and offering back to God. And it's just really a, a great opportunity. It always makes me feel so good to be able to do this. And there's ways that we can do this. You can do it online at livingwater.com slash give and go to the Yelm drop down because we are one church, three campuses. So you'll see Olympia, Lacey, and Yelm. But Yelm is the best. That was really lame. Yelm is the best. Woo -hoo -hoo! All right. Okay. So you can do that. You can text to give. I tried that. I thought, where's it going to go? And it went to the right place. And then, uh, or you can give in person with these handsome gentlemen on the side. So let's pray over this. Father, I want to pray over every gift and everything and the givers that give this offering, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that you would bless this, that, that it go to your kingdom, Lord because it's biblical and it's a great thing to stand on that we'd be able to give back to this community and this church. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in your name. Amen. Hey, would you guys thank Sam for all he does, for who he is? Yep, God bless you as you give. If I haven't met you yet, I'm Bob Horn. I'm lead pastor here at Living Water Young, which is the best place in the world. It's good to see you this morning. We're wrapping up a series called Generosity, and today's message is titled generosity, changing the world through your time, talent, and treasure. Let me ask you some questions as we kind of get ready to get into the Word. What would it mean to you to know that by giving yourself away, your time, your talent, your treasure, you're creating an impact on the world around you? Would that mean something to you? If you could see the direct impact of your generosity, your time, your talent, your treasure, you could see it result in the changed life of even just one person. Would that cause you to want to give more or less? More. What would it mean to you if you clearly knew that what you gave away, your time, your talent, your treasure, would be a good investment and that the return wasn't just in this world, but it was in the world to come, that your investment would be eternal? Would that be of value to you? I want to share with you this morning three characteristics of people who change the world with their time, their talent, and their treasure. Let's pray. Gracious God, we're going to open up your word here in a second, and as we do, Lord, we ask for you to do a few things for us. First, Lord, that, we would, that you would reveal your character and nature. See, here's the thing, God. We, we really want to know who you are. We want to understand who you are. When we talk about things like money and generosity, we, get, we can get a pretty confused picture of, of who you are. You are a generous God. I pray that you would reveal that aspect of your character really well today. Ask Jesus that today as we open your word, you would remind us who we are because we're forgetful. And it's easy for us to give in to the world and what the world says 
we are to be. Even the people around us, they tell us who we're supposed to be. But today, our identity is found in you, Jesus. So remind us who we are. As we open your word, we want to see you, Jesus. You're the one that we're pursuing. You're the ones that we are disciples of. So, Jesus, show us yourself. And then, God, as, as we spend time in your word, let us be changed by it. That your word would be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. So we walk differently. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. If you have a Bible or a device, I'd like you to open it up to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago. Last Sunday, Pastor Sam had an amazing message about talents and, and the gifts that you have. And we're going to go back to this passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians 9 that I shared a couple of weeks before. It's written by the Apostle Paul. And, um, you know, I think I said something last time that I want to correct. And, and it's, a, it's interesting. It's kind of a, a misnomer in Christianity is that I think I might have said the Apostle Paul was originally Saul until Jesus changed his name. That's not true. His name is Paul, but he has, that's his Greek name, but his, his Hebrew name is Saul. He goes by both names. And so if I said that, I stand corrected because he was encountered by Jesus. See, here's the thing. Saul was a member of kind of the religious elite, Pharisee of Pharisees, and, and he was a persecutor of the Christians, this fledgling sect that was forming that was promoting Jesus as the Messiah, and he saw it as a threat to, to Judaism. So he got letters to go to Damascus and to hunt down Christians, put them in prison, and on his way... The risen Jesus meets him. Light shining all around him, knocks him to the ground. He's blinded for three days. And Jesus calls him to go to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish world, and the, and the nation of Israel, and to preach Jesus. And he does. He, he has this radical transformation. Goes from persecutor of Christians to now... Um, a, a pastor, a church planter, an evangelist, and plants churches throughout the Mediterranean, throughout Asia Minor, and he's writing this letter to one of those churches in Cor Corinth. Corinth is located in Greece. It's 50 miles west of Athens, and in this part of 2 Corinthians, he's explaining how he's receiving a collection of money to take, that he was taking in the Gentile churches in Philippi and Galatia and Corinth for the impoverished Jewish Christians in the mother church of Jerusalem. So again, it's just kind of crazy that here's this man who was persecuting Christians, was met by Jesus and so radically transformed by the person of Jesus that now he is living a life of generosity and exhorting the churches that follow Jesus to live a life of generosity as well. We're going to read 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 15, and I'll focus on the second half of this section. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Everybody smile. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work, as it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. We're going to go through this verses uh, 10 to 15, and I'll just break this down make some comments, give you three, again, three characteristics of people who change the world with their time, talent, and treasure. 
Verse 10 says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. God supplies everything we need. He's the only one who supplies everything we need. Some of us are under the illusion that our hard work supplies what we need. Some of you are under the illusion that your employer who gives you a paycheck every two weeks is your supplier. Some of us are under the illusion that, that it's our effort, our strength, what we can accomplish that supplies what we need. But what Scripture tells us is that He's the one who supplies. And if you have that confused, you're going to run into trouble in this life. If you believe that you're the one who I've got to get the work done, my family is counting on me to be the supplier. Let me just tell you, God is your supplier. God supplies everything we need. He's not only the one who supplies, he's the one who gives increase. It's not us. Everything flows from his hand. There too, if you just got a raise or you want to get a raise and you're like, I got to work harder, got to get this stuff done, got to, got to do the thing so that I get noticed, people see me, I can get the raise, God's the one who gives the increase. I'm not saying don't work hard. I'm not saying don't do your best. I'm just saying understand who's the one who supplies and who's the one who gives the increase. He gives you, let's, let's talk about what he gives you, okay? Look at this. He gives you time. Did you know that every single one of us get 24 hours a day? Every single one of us. Raise your hand if you get 25. You do not. Yeah. There are some of us who think that you have less than 24 hours, never have enough time, right? But here's the reality. Every one of us has 24 hours in a day. We all choose different ways to spend that 24 hours. Let me show you some ways that people spend their 24 hours. 41 minutes per day watching YouTube. I think that's, a, that's an average that it really um, encompasses people that don't spend any time and then people that spend about eight hours <laughs> averaging. 95 minutes per day on TikTok. Where are my TikTokers? I'm not one of you. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> I don't even understand it. And yeah. But this is me, 294 minutes per day watching TV. I can tell you who was kicked off a survivor this week. Not proud of the fact, I'm just being vulnerable with you. But here's the thing, average American spends seven hours and four minutes staring at a screen per day. Seven hours and four minutes on average. Now, sure, a lot of that's, you know, your work screen, but still, it's a lot of screen time. Somebody needs to tell us to go out and play. Gives you time. What else does God give us? He gives us talent. And by talent, I don't mean like um, pageant show talent. I can twirl a baton. That's my talent. No, I'm talking about a number of things. Like he gives you your personality and your character traits. Are you outgoing, stubborn, quiet, visionary, thoughtful, funny? That's part of who, what God has supplied you with. He gives you life experience, your family background, education, profession, work history, your experiences, your wisdom, your relationships, your connection. God supplies that to you. He gives you your giftings. Pastor Sam's message highlighted that. Every single one of you have gifts, natural abilities, spiritual abilities, skill sets and capacities that God has empowered you with. You have passions. And not just interests, things that are like hobbies, like, oh, that's my passion, and I'm passionate about gardening. I mean, people and places that you care deeply about to the point where the passion actually causes pain because you're so passionate about that people or place. It could be youth, Africa, the homeless, entrepreneurs, young moms, children. Gives you talent. And then he gives you treasure. And a lot of us, you know, we look at our bank account and we say, Lord, this is, this is hard. Yeah, in this day and age, it's very challenging for us, many of us, to live on, on what we have. It's an expensive time in life to live. But I want to give you some perspective, lest you think that God has not given you treasure. If your household income is $60,000 per year, 
you earn more than 91% of the globe. Puts it in perspective. I mean, by comparison, every single one of us in this room are rich. If you make more than $2,000 a year, you are rich by comparison. I've traveled to the Philippines, to Thailand, to Mexico, and I've seen people, I've met people that live on $2 a day. And those are among the 700 million living in extreme poverty. And I remember it was in 2002, walking around the slums and squatter villages of Manila, Philippines, literally see, meeting people that lived on top of a dump. And what was striking was just how, how joyful so many of them were. I think they knew they lived in poverty, but yet there was just a joy just about them, especially those that had encountered Jesus. So God gives you time, He gives you talent, and He gives you treasure. In verse 10, there's this, this statement that, he will, that God will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. And I thought about that for a minute. Like, what is this harvest of righteousness? God's the one who will enlarge it. I thought, what will be the harvest, the, the fruit, the outcomes, the purpose of our life in Christ on this earth? See, your life's going to end at some point in time. And there will be a decision point at the end of that life where you will either enter into God's reward or, or not. <laughs> and the not is not a really good, uh, good place. But when you enter into God's reward, you're going to have a moment where you're going to just see your entire life before your eyes. Every decision, every conversation, every word that you've spoken. And you're going to see the harvest of your righteousness right on display. And Jesus is going to ask you, how did you invest your time, your talent, your treasure to love? A question I want to invite you to explore is what will be the harvest of your righteousness? Begin with the end in mind. Anybody who's in project management, you're going to do a little Gantt chart. You're going to be like, let's start with the end. Let's work our way back to where we are now and let's figure out how we're going to get this project done. What's going to be the harvest of your righteousness? Because it starts with sowing something. Again, the verse says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Robert Morris, in his book, The Blessed Life, he says, Notice that it doesn't say, God supplies seed to the keeper. He supplies seed to sowers, those who will scatter. Morris writes, I've heard people say, Sure, that guy's a giver, but he can afford to be. He's got money. They have it backwards. That guy has money because he's a giver. God is supplying seed to the sower. Here's my first point for you. Be a sower, not a keeper. Thursday morning, I was at Worthy Coffee, and I was meeting with an army chaplain that I've gotten to know over the last few weeks. And um, we were having coffee and having conversation. And, you know, I didn't have an agenda. I just wanted to just spend time with him. We are kind of getting, developing this friendship. He's 36, he's got a family, and we're just sharing stories. And our, our conversation went down a road where I was like, realized that there's an opportunity for me here to, to help him. I'm a certified life coach in addition to being a pastor, and I realized this is a coaching opportunity. He needs some clarity around this issue. And so I just sensed in that moment that this is an opportunity for me to really give away some coaching skills that I might otherwise charge money for. But in this moment, I was like, Let's just, this is time for me just to give away what God has given me. So I gave away my time. I gave away my coaching skills. Bought him a, his coffee. Jesus bought him the coffee because you all paid for it. <laughs> Thank you. And I was helping him just get clarity on reestablishing priorities in his life. And, and as he gained clarity on what changes he wanted to make, there was something, something that happened in me that I want to share with you. Because I asked him a question. I asked all right, as you make those changes in your life, who benefits? And he just paused, and then he just began listing. Well, I'll benefit making those changes in my life. My kids, Allie, my family, extended family, my friends, the soldiers in my unit, their spouses, their families, their friends. And I realized that by sowing my time, my talent, and my treasure, 
I was changing his world. And it made me just want to keep on sowing. I call that just a ripple effect. Like that was an eye opener for me. It made me want to keep sowing. Let's move on to verse 11. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. God enriches us in every way with our time, our talent, our treasure so that, what does it say? We can be generous on every occasion. What are those occasions? Is it only when I plan to give? Is it only when I show up and I say, all right, I'm ready to give, given my 10%, that's what I plan to give? Or am I generous on every occasion when I didn't plan to give? Coffee shop being an example. I, I can... There are times when our giving is spontaneous and spirit-led, but we have to be listening to the Holy Spirit to recognize those moments. There are times when I have, um, when I have had to listen to the Holy Spirit to realize that this is one of those moments. Give it away right now. By the way, we believe here at Living Water Yelm that we can hear God's voice through the Holy Spirit. We believe that God speaks to us here and now. And we can hear God's voice through the Holy Spirit. So I I just try to position myself where I can lean into being generous and and living open-handed. I need a helper. I need a volunteer who um, likes cash. (laughs) Somebody... Uh, let's do this. Since we just had an amazing time on Sunday night with our young people, I need a student, a young person who uh, likes cash and um, you're broke. Okay? <laughs> Somebody. Okay. Mark May, come on up here. All right, would you welcome Mark as he comes up here? <clears throat> Thanks, man. All right. You like cash? I do. All right. Okay. Um, I want you to hold out your hand, okay? I'm going to place. Who's on that? I can't read that. Hamilton. That's Hamilton, yeah. Wasn't there, wasn't there like a musical about him? I think it was a movie. Okay, I'm going to put Hamilton in your hand, okay? Um, now, you can do a couple of things with that right now. You can hold it like that, or you can grab it tightly with your fist, all right? All right, fist around it. Notice that when he's got the money, the $10 bill, in a fist, I can't take it out of his hand, right? But what also can't happen? I can't put anything in either, can I? Right? Now, let's, for demonstration purposes, hold that $10 bill with an open hand, okay? When you're living life open-handedly, you're sharing generously on every occasion. And when you're open-handed, God can enrich you in every way. Because I can take the $10 and say, thank you for living open-handedly. Thank you for being my volunteer. (laughs) Wait. (laughs) But if he holds his hand open, living open-handedly, I can put a Jackson in place of that Hamilton. Thank you for being open-handed. Yeah. Now, Mark May, live open-handed with that, okay? (laughs) Spirit-led, obedient generosity will result in people giving thanks to God. Uh, There's a um, principle that I'll just call instant obedience. Maybe, parents, you taught your kids this way, instant obedience, like obey on the first time. Don't have to count to three for you to obey. (laughs) instant obedience. There's a principle for us as Christ followers that when I sense the Holy Spirit saying, give it away, the $20 bill for instance, give it away. (laughs) There's a principle of instant obedience to say, all right, I'm going to do it first time you ask because the longer I wait, the more time there is for my mind and my emotions to cloud the message. You been there? You walk away from an instance and you go, I think Holy Spirit was telling me to do something in there and 
I didn't. Darn it. I would say this. I'd say at least you're looking through your rear view mirror because there's a lot of people that aren't even, they're bla blazing right past an opportunity and not even looking through the rear view mirror. So that's a, that's a good first step. But principle of instant obedience. I can't tell you how many times I've heard God nudge me to give, to buy that meal, to pay for that coffee, to invite them over, to give away my skills. And I just, I miss the moment. And I believe that that'll be one of the things that I'll stand before Jesus and see my life and go, yep, I missed it. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me because I blew that one. But I'm learning to not wait when I sense that nudge. This week, you will sense that nudge. If you are walking with Jesus and you're leaning into the Holy Spirit, there will be a nudge, there'll be a moment, there'll be an opportunity for generosity because Jesus knows what message you're hearing right now. And he'll say, let's see what you do with that. And there'll be a moment of a nudge and remind yourself right now, let me just obey instantly. Let me respond to what God's saying. Verse 12, the service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because the generosity of the Corinthians wasn't just meeting the needs of the Jerusalem church, it was bringing more and more thanks to God. So here's my point too, be generous on every occasion. I want to just tell you another, just more, more of what happened on Sunday night, because the generosity, more and more people are thanking God because of the generosity of our youth leadership team. This is a team that did not exist six months ago. And as they formed throughout the summer and into September and October, we, we made this plan. They, I just facilitated the conversation, they made this plan to have this, this, thanks, this Friendsgiving Youth Worship Night. And I, I've shared with people like, yeah, we had 41 students there. And I realized that's not the headline. The headline is watching this youth leadership team serve out of their gifts, out of their talents, to give away their time, their talent, and their treasure, and to see the fruit just be a natural consequence of it. That was the beautiful thing. They enri God enriched them so they could be generous with their time, talent, and their treasure. They lived open-handedly, and young lives are impacted by Jesus. And more and more people are thanking God because of their generosity. Would you like to thank God for their generosity right now? Let's do it. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Verse 13, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. There's an obedience to the gospel that accompanies your confession of the gospel. When we live in obedience to the gospel, others will notice it and praise God for it. What's the gospel? This is Ephesians 1, 3 through 8. I find this to be a pretty good summary of the good news of Jesus. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with, him, with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. That's the gospel. That's why Jesus came. And obedience to the gospel results in and is evidenced by a life of generosity. If you have confessed that gospel, said, that is my Jesus. He saved me. He purchased me. He redeemed me. I have hope when this life is over because of Jesus. There is an obedience to the gospel that results in generosity. And this generosity isn't limited to fellow believers, but it includes everyone else. Our generosity extends beyond our church walls and our church community. Let me say this. I believe that generosity needs to pour out of this place. That this is already a generous church, and this is a church where generosity can pour out of these walls into our city, into our community, into our places of business, and into the world. Do you feel that? That this is a place where God has given you so much 
just the gospel in itself is cause for generosity. And generosity should pour out of this place. And others will praise God when we share generously with them and to everyone else. God gets glorified when we give. Wrapping it up, verse 14 and 15. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The easy to read version, which I look up every once in a while, it says, and when they pray, they will wish they could be with you. They will feel this way because of the great grace that God gave you. Where's God giving you great grace? Grace is undeserved favor. You have something that really isn't the work of your hand, the result of your hard work or effort. God gave you the strength, the intellect, the wisdom, the creativity, the passion to pursue it. That's grace. So point three is give from God's great grace given. I want to invite up Christina Garcia to just share the great grace that God has given her and the way her calling, her passion, and the gifts that she has has led her to give up her time, talent, and treasure to some children that live in Nakasita, Uganda. Would you welcome Christina? All right. Well, so Christina, how have you seen God's grace, God's great grace in your life result in generosity? So good morning, everybody. Hold that right up. Hold that right up close. Hold that right up close. Right up close. <laughs> when I was praying through this question, an example came to mind that's fairly emotional for me. So some of you may know that back in 2021, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. <clears throat> Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear those words. It kind of turned your life upside down. But I uh, found myself in need of immediate surgery and so caught myself up in that whirlwind, um, but immediately found myself surrounded by support. I mean, absolutely surrounded by support uh, from family, from friends, from people right in this church. And there wasn't a day that went by that I didn't have a homemade casserole on my doorstep. Thank you, sis. <laughs> or a homemade pot of soup. Thank you, Patricia. Or flowers or cards or gifts. It was absolutely overwhelming. And in the midst of that, yes, I recovered from a surgery and I had a double mastectomy, but I learned even more about what it meant to live generously. And that's the way that I wanted to live my life. And I thought that I was a generous person. I thought that I was a compassionate person. But when I witnessed that outpouring of love, I knew I wanted to live that way out loud even more and that it wasn't the end of my story. That's good. Um, how has your calling, passion, gifts led you to give your time, talent, and treasure to children in Nakasita, Uganda? <laughs> This is my favorite. Well, first of all, everybody here was in worship this morning. How can we not respond to a God who gives everything for us? Uh, you, heard, you heard the worship. You heard the reckless love. You heard about how God pours himself out to us, how he gave every single thing for us. And so that's the lens that I come from when I wake up every day. I want to be able to give my time. I want to be able to give my talents. He gave me talent as a nurse. I want to be able to critically think and to problem solve. So that's one piece of it. Um, the treasure is my favorite. My husband, Pedro, teases me because he says that I work in order to be able to give my money away. But it's true. And <clears throat> you talked about living with open hands, and that's really how I try to live my life. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Mm. So some of you may know that I am the president and co-founder of Hope Restored Christian Ministries, and we support a village in eastern Uganda, including a school of 500 kids and 18 teachers that are there. It's amazing. Absolutely love it. And I'll be traveling there at the end of January. <clears throat> but I was thinking about a story about a teacher who teaches primary four over there, equivalent to our fourth grade, named Janet. And Janet learned of a young 11-year-old girl named Catherine. It's very common over there because of their lifestyles for uh, children to be abandoned, orphaned, neglected, abused. 
And Janet took Catherine into her home as a teacher, and they live in very meager circumstances, but she took her into her home and, and cared for her and spent time after school in the evenings catching her up on her schoolwork so that Catherine could get up to grade level. That's what the teachers are like there. That's how they live their lives. That's how they give of their talent, time, and resources. And I thought to myself, I really need to up my game if that's how they live over there. It's just pretty astonishing and amazing. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to be able to bless the teachers and take them out for a day when we go there. So just another way that you can give of time, talent, and resources. I'll be in the lobby after the service. Um, after Christmas in the park that you heard about on December 2nd, if you wanted to run over to the Yum Lions Club cabin. Um, I'm a Lions Club member and I love to give up my time that way too, but we'll be doing a chili fundraiser. You can give a one-time gift today. You can give a recurring gift today. You can come out to the fundraiser and just paint a holiday plate and have fun that way. But those are the things that came That's to my mind. That's good. Would you thank Christina for sharing? Thank you. Thanks everyone. In the, in the time that remains, I want to do two things. I want everybody first, would you just stand up? If you're a middle schooler or a high schooler, I want to invite you to take the remainder of our service with our youth, our youth leadership team. High schoolers are going to go to the cafe. Middle schoolers are going to go out these doors over here down to the end of the children's ministry hallway. And you're invited to go there now. For those of you that are standing, generosity flows from gratitude. And verse 15 says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. I want to just take a couple of minutes in this week leading up to Thanksgiving and just allow you to just share short phrases of thanks for God's indescribable gift. And as you share them out loud, just letting your voice project in the room, we're going to hear those and we're going to be encouraged by what you're thanking God for and it's going to spur thanksgiving in us. So would you do that? Just lead out one at a time, just short phrases of thanksgiving to God, thanking him for his indescribable gift. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, thank you, God, for my wife, Kiki and Sarah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Home, I come home, and she's constantly telling me about children that need to be fed and uh, all over the world, stuff like that. That's good. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your promises. Thank you, God, for your generosity. Thank you, Lord, for the vision you have for the church. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for loving me despite my failures. And mm -hmm. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. And as they come, two or three more of you. You haven't said anything yet, and the Lord's been poking at your heart. Say it out loud so we can agree with you. Gracious God, thank you for the indescribable gift of life, of saving us, of your gospel. 
Jesus coming down, dying in our place and setting us free. Lord, let generosity flow from this place because of the immense generosity that flowed from heaven to us. We give you praise. We give you all glory, all honor. We choose to worship you and to give you all our gratitude. In Jesus' name. Let's conclude with just a time of giving him our gratitude and praise.